Welcome to the third episode of our 10-part series called Retrospective. In this episode, we discuss how did you pay for your MFA and was it worth it? You will hear conversations with my fellow graduates, Allison Goldberg, Ricardo Rivera, Amanda Marchand, Brett Gottschall, Erez Golan, Peter Wu, and Joram Wahlberger. Yes, I took out loans. When my first husband and I were together, we were not married. And so I took out loans that were in my name. And then we got married. And this is airing airing some dirty business, but I'll just share, I'll just share this with you. I ended up on a on two of his as a co-signer on two of his student loans. Ooh. And so the whole student loan process has just been horrendous. I eventually get ended up getting help from my family in the last year to pay off my loans. Okay, wait, just to be clear, in the last year. So that means 20 years after graduation, you have finally paid off your loans. Yes. Congratulations. I'm Thank still you. not there. Yes. I'm waiting for the 25 year write off. Yes. But my credit is ruined because my name is attached to these other loans and they've been deferred for so long and all kinds of other stuff. So, yeah. But, and this is something I was thinking about because I sat back and I was like, if somebody had really explained to me a student loan at the age I was when I signed a student loan, mm -hmm. I probably would have put more thought into agreeing to that loan at that time. Do you feel like you were like given all the information to like make a, an intelligent decision when you chose to take on? I, I, I'm, like, I'm assuming it was a pretty substantial loan, probably similar to mine. So... Like we're like I was I you know in hindsight I was far too young to take on such a big fucking loan and with with like for all practical purposes no career aspirations that would ever be able to pay them off. So, do you feel that you were prepared? I was definitely not prepared. I, for good and bad, have a family that has idealized what it means to be an artist. And so I was always encouraged to do that by them without any practical consideration of what that would mean. And so they encouraged me <laughs> to take on the debt that I would really have no way of paying back. So no, I was not prepared. I mean, no one advised, they, 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 you know, it, the people that should have had, had, should have had, you know, somewhat more sense and idea about what that meant. They could not guide me in any practical way. Are you saying your family or are yes. you saying, okay, I'm okay. saying my family. Okay. I'm just, I wasn't quite sure. Cause like my family basically tried to discourage me from taking mm -hmm. out student loans as much as possible. And I was just like, ah, whatever, I'll be getting a job afterwards. I can pay this back. Mm -hmm. No, not, not, not true at all. Yeah. Do you feel like, like in hindsight that it was money well spent, like that you, that it was worth the, well, <sighs> at this point, not only like the money spent, but the hassle of the, student the time. Loans. Yeah. The, the trajectory, all of that. I'll tell you what I feel. <laughs> I feel that I didn't necessarily get the best undergraduate education. Where did you go for undergraduate? I went to UC Santa Cruz, which was a fabulous school and a great place to yeah. go to college. Mm -hmm. But I was an art major and I was I did not have like a scope of what I could study like I was pigeonholed too early on. I think, I think if my experience there had been a little broader and a little more rigorous, 
then perhaps I wouldn't have gone down that road of graduate school. But I did get what I got out of graduate school was thinking more rigorously and and pursuing ideas in a very different way that I got in undergrad, if that makes sense. And so I'm grateful to it for that. I'm grateful to the experience for all of that. I, absolutely. I took up student loans and it wasn't that much, but it really, the interest really messed me up because I kept going into forbearance and asking financial aid for more support. And it was a great experience, but now I don't recommend it to anybody because it could be debilitating if you're not in a position to repay that. And I didn't realize that. And I, I'm still paying for that. I'm still paying my student loan. Me too. It's in the, I don't mind even sharing how much it is. It's about uh, $60,000 60, now. Six yeah. zero. Yeah. That's interesting. So is mine. <laughs> Like exactly the same. I just looked at it the other day and I was just like, holy fuck, it's still $60,000. Yeah. Uh, but, but fortunately, I did have a plan and I'm on the income based contingency repayment plan. I just have a few more uh, years of teaching and uh, public service and I'm, I'm going to try to apply for that uh, public service forgiveness. And hopefully, it's when this administration is still in charge. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's what it's only 10 years, I think, of public service to get to qualify for that, right? Yeah. Many of my service was adjunct, and I, they're not going to accept that. So it had to be full time. Oh, it had to be full time? Yeah, from, from what, what I researched previously. Yeah. But everything changes so much with all of that. Like, it was almost impossible for my readings for people to claim that under the uh, Orange Man administration. Well, I had, at one point, I had worked for a nonprofit organization for nine years. That would have done it. <laughs> and then the nonprofit organization closed after like nine and a half years. At this point, I'm just like, fuck it. But at this point, I'm quite honestly waiting for the, what is it, 25 years? You, you, they just write the whole thing off? Yeah. It should, we should already be there. <laughs> Now, were your experiences at FSAI and then, I guess, the outcome of getting a master's from there, like, quote, unquote, like, worth the money? So that's a very capitalistic approach. For me, I don't really think of education as a product, as, a re as you, you're going to get a return on investment. I think of it as a process of growing. And I think that as a student, I didn't realize that. Now I do. So was it worth it? Now I wouldn't do it. I don't never recommend it to any of my students. If anything, find a school that is fully funded. UC Davis MFA program is fully funded. Get in, so, so advice to young MFA students is get into those kinds of programs so that you could not worry about when you exit the MFA program what you're going to do because you're, you're still going to be at zero. And the possibilities after receiving an MFA doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to become an artist. What it means is that you understand the world in the eyes of an artist. So if you wanted to open a restaurant and you have that drive, you have that from, for me, from the creative process of how to approach that. You know how to tackle new territories, scary territories, you know? And so, so for me, it's more of like uh, growing and if I really wanted to go back and get an education, another MFA, I would go back and get an MFA in classics or something like that. Something as useless as possible in terms of the return on investment, but the return on my mind would be incredible. You know, I think that 
yeah, I don't know, maybe a, a MFA in poetry or something like that. I'll make a lot of money. Well, the reason why I ask is because I remember when we were there that like all of the, uh, and it wasn't the teachers, but it was like the administrative people and the the counselors and all these people going like, oh, well, if you get a degree in this program, you can get a job that earns this much. And they sort of said like the investment of getting a student loan for this amount of money will be easy to repay because you're going to get a job that will pay this much if you go into this field. That's interesting. I think I had a different financial aid officer because they were trying to, they would, they were, he was actually very compassionate. And I remember him saying like, are you sure you want to take this loan out? What, and he would be asking me like, what are you going to do after you take this loan? Like very cautiously, like not saying you shouldn't take this loan. Just like, are you sure you want to do this? I'm like, yeah, what's wrong with you? Give me the money, fool. <laughs> So I have to admit, I, I I was horrible with money back then. And if I could go back, I would definitely do things differently. Just as far as the money part. I mean, that's, that's, uh, easily, I mean, in retrospect, a lot of us would do things differently. I got a scholarship. So I think it was half the tuition. I think the tuition was 16,000. And then my parents helped me out, but I'd also been working in the Bahamas for three years and I'd socked away a lot of money from this job. So I had some money and I also worked at the Walter McBean part-time on campus, the Walter McBean gallery. Okay. I'm sorry. I want to know more about the Bahamas. What? (laughs) This doesn't relate to the San Francisco Art Institute. (laughs) Yes. I had a job writing a screenplay with an elderly woman and I was there for two years and then in Montreal for one year working on this film, that film screenplay about the 1837 rebellion of lower Canada. It was a fictional film that sort of gone with the wind of Canada. I did that right before grad school. I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> it was a little nugget of my life that took me in a different direction, but was pretty amazing. Is it on IMDb? No, other things came out of that, but the film was never made. John uh, Frankenheimer was going to direct it, and Colin Welland, who wrote the screenplay to Chariots of Fire, rewrote our version for Hollywood. So it went pretty far, but the woman who was, uh, you know, at the helm uh, decided that it, it had veered too far away from her original version. She was bit rigid so unfortunately it didn't happen but it's still out in the world it could still happen i suppose yes Mm -hmm. i mean i think for me i took a big break between my undergraduate degree in english literature and then art and i knew i was just ready to push like i was 100 percent sure that i was going for it so if you take that time you're kind of using everything you can to to move forward you know on all levels and 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 so i don't know i mean having the debt it's something that is the debt is so much huger today though so that's like a really big question for kids going to school today i bet my child wants to go to design school next year he's applying right now so we're looking at i was i didn't he was headed for art school but it looks that way now so We'll see. Was your experience at the San Francisco since SFAI worth the money? 100%. It was a great, great investment. Like, best two years. I worked night and day. I was completely immersed. I explored everything I could. I worked at the gallery. I really appreciated the teachers and what they were doing and looking at how they were bridging being an artist in the real world and teaching and making and all of that was so valuable for me. A loan. I didn't get any scholarships, government loan, and which I'm still paying. That was going to be the next question. Yeah. Still paying. And, uh, uh, that, yeah, there's another story with that too, but I think I got a government loan. Then I also took out like a 
a personal loan as well, just to to live a little bit better while I was there, to buy and to buy some more paint. Yeah, <laughs> and in my case, you know, I'm working for a nonprofit organization, which is uh, you know, museums, educators. The do-gooders, the the service people, <laughs> teachers, would be teachers. another one. Yeah, yes, teachers and priests. Or that's another one. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's a forgiveness program for ten years of service, supposedly. Right? I don't know if you've looked into that, but I have heard about this. Now you've been working at a nonprofit for more than ten years. So yeah, how did yeah. that work out? After I think after about my eighth, seventh, or eighth year at the museum learned about this somebody else told me about it that hey you should you should get a hold of you know the the government people there is a program that you can work towards forgiveness after 10 years of service like man i've already had you know eight years or whatever and i i called and of course i was on the wrong plan the the wrong repayment plan and so i said let's get me on the right one i thought that that had happened and then when I came, I came back after, after my ten year mark to check on it, and, and it, it was somehow it was screwed up, and I wasn't I wasn't on this that track, and so uh, it's only been uh, the past I don't know five years or so that that I've been on the right the right path, but also like you know I've already put in my time. Can't you uh, you know retroactively <laughs> give me a break here? Now I'm on 16 years, you know, and I, I'm still, they still haven't, haven't done anything to, but maybe with, uh, with our new president and, uh, all the talk of, of forgiving all student loan, I don't know, maybe something will happen now, but uh, in the meantime, I have to start repaying again, post COVID shutdown. I don't know. Yeah, I know. Me too. I'm still paying yeah. my loan. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've, I'm I'm waiting for the 25 year write down. Like I'm just not, I'm just not even trying. Like at this point, because <laughs> I, I mean, you is that a true thing? Because I've heard about this. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I think it's I think it's true. Okay, yeah, as far as I've I've even spoken to tax attorneys about it about and basically what they say is 25 years after the the graduation date, I think, or maybe it's the loan. Yeah, cuz the graduation date is when the loan sort of started being repaid. You can um you can at 25 years you can basically write it off, but the problem with that is is you have to however much money that is is taxable in mm-hmm. that year. Yeah, yeah. So your tax bill will be exorbitant for one year, but your loan will be gone. That's that's okay with me. I will do. I will take out a private loan just to fucking pay that back to be done with the goddamn government loans because they are yes. the worst. Uh, uh. I mean, they do everything in their power to fuck us. Like, yeah. and, oh my god, so bad. They, yeah, I mean, they're yeah. the worst predatory. Corporations, period. Like the amount of times my loan has passed to different companies, and every time it passes to a new company, then it's a whole new, like, oh, I need to negotiate with you. Like, fuck's sake. Like, just, yeah. Just, I mean, if it had stayed with the original company or the government loan that I had and it just stayed there the whole time, I probably would have paid it off by now. But the amount of like changes and problems and drama and additional fees and all this fucking shit. Yeah. Yeah, I I I know exactly what you're what you're talking about. Uh and you know, just trying to get a hold of them to even talk to somebody is is another chore. It's like, uh, you know, I I don't have time to you know, even even via email or you know, but you know, I want to talk to somebody on the phone. You know, I want to I want to talk to like I'm talking to you, you know. Like I would love it. Like I I would have a better respect for those cor- whatever corporations, governments, whatever they are. If like they said, "Here's the name and phone number and email of your loan officer." Oh, and if yes. you have any problems or concerns, contact this person. Yeah. Even if the person was a fucking idiot, I don't care. Yeah. But knowing I had one person that I could always contact yeah. and they knew my situation, it would be amazing. But they just it's literally just like customer service. You just call in and you get whoever the fuck is on the line. And, yeah. they, and yeah. they have no idea who you are. And they have this God, it drives me fucking nuts. Anyways. Yeah. 
yeah, it's a yeah a, another uh, another reminder that you don't really exist in that world. Mm. I don't know, but yeah, I, I I feel the pain there, and I just I just want it to be done too. You know, I think we've all paid that loan uh, one t- at least one time over. Yeah, let's be done with it. For me, I never. Uh, <laughs> Yes, uh, we're still talking about the pains of paying things back. But I mean, I I never had it in my mind, you know, that I was going to worry myself about how much it cost. You know, I was going to do it regardless. However, I, you know, if somebody else paid for it the whole way, I got a scholarship. I didn't get a scholarship. It was just going to happen. For my own sanity, I just, uh, I never really... Uh, thought about it that hard. I mean, I knew I had the responsibility to pay it back and that's what I've been doing. I don't think I've ever been late on a payment or I do it, but I, I never, it was never part of the equation for me to think about, you know, I just wanted to do what I, what I like to do and, and be around the people I like to be around. And, and that's me, you know, I got more opportunities there and rose in the ranks, however few there were, and still are, <laughs> at the museum. But that was, that was I, I heard it, you know, I heard it out loud from people, you know, oh, he's got a master's degree, and, you know, uh, let's, uh, let's give him this, uh, this opportunity. And I get paid more. And I used that, I don't know, maybe, you know, in three or four negotiations over my 16 years, you know, like, you know, I've paid my dues, uh, just like this curator over here that has their master's degree. You know, I deserve this. Give it to me. <laughs> no, it's good to hear. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, like I'm the, you know, I'm, I finally just actually got promoted to a full professor now. Oh, congratulations. Thank you very much. Does the word uh, tenure still uh, mean anything in your world? No, it's no. a part-time job, so there's right. no such thing as tenure for it. Yeah. But uh, but my next job, my next full-time job, I will be looking for that tenure position for okay. sure because okay. I'm already a professor. There you, there you go. You have it in your pocket. You should wear a badge or something on your shirt. I know, I know. My dad <laughs> has his doctorate, and so he jokingly liked to be called the right doctor reverend Timothy Doles because he's a reverend and a doctor. And when they have the two, he gets the right put in front of it. Wow. Yeah. Goals, man. Goals. I, t- I tell you. Yeah, life goals. Get a business card that says all that shit on it. Yeah. If anybody still uses business cards. I know. Business cards. You can't, use, can't be wasting paper like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just a text message now. Yeah, uh, it's an air, airdrop. I'll airdrop you. It's just, well, it's just the... <laughs> It's just a, a tagline on my Instagram page is all yeah. it is at this point. Yeah. Anyhow, so to answer your question, yeah. yes, it's worth it. It was worth it. To me, it was worth it. I'd do it again. I ended up getting a scholarship from the defense ministry here in Israel. My dad was a, an IDF pilot, and he died when I was two and a quarter years old. So ever since... Being an, sort of an orphan, kind of an IDF orphan, they did finance my undergrad program. And at the time, there was no grad program in photography in Israel. So when I told them that I want to get my grad degree, they said, well, we'll finance it if you do it in Israel. Apparently, there is no one in Israel. So we'll give you a third of your tuition if you do it elsewhere. So that was nice. That was a good start. It's excellent. I actually worked. From, from the moment we got to the U.S., I started working as I was the security person at the Walnut Creek Jewish Center for a while, the JCC at Walnut Creek. Okay. And, and I did that for, I guess, maybe eight months or so. And then, and then I got a little sick. I had to go back and, and get kind of an operation back in Israel while we were in grad school. That prevented me from spending most of my second semester in the U.S. I was gone for almost a full semester. It was kind of the end of the first semester to the middle of the second semester or so. I was away. 
but did my catch up pretty soon after. It was actually as soon as I finished the sailboat piece, I went to Israel. And, you know, for me, the Diego Rivera position was a lifesaver. I mean, that that also went into the tuition by itself, you know, on its own. And then my parents helped in a little bit. I mean, everyone was was helping. You know, the government was helping. I was working. My parents pitched in. I did the Diego Rivera position. I mean, you know, money was definitely an issue. We weren't living large at the time. You know, everything was going to, you know, kind of art materials and film and and printing and you know, but that's that, that was it. That we were doing that, and that was the focus. And I had no kids at the time, and Sharon and I weren't married, so it was just me taking care of myself at the end of the day and focusing on art, which is possible. You eat pizza and you do it, basically. I remember you and I talking about uh, uh, the cost of a print that you made. That was like you were comparing it. You said like I could have bought a new sofa for that price. <laughs> yeah. Easily, easily, no doubt. And but but that was the focus at the time. And you know, I was, I I have to say, I mean, I managed to sell quite a bit of artwork at the time, so that helped out a little bit. You know, photography you can reproduce a couple. You know, you've got. I I, I made sure I don't have an edition of three, but maybe twelve. That makes it easier. And we I did sell some, and um, that always helped. I still remember to this day, we actually have a set of pans and pots that I bought from uh, uh, Bar- Wait, what is it called? No, Crate and Barrel. They're called Old Clad. I, I sold my first piece, I think, in, in the U.S. for maybe, I don't know, maybe $1,200 or something like that. And went and bought for $600 pots and pans. And they were so great. We still have them. We still use them. So that's, you know, 18 years later, we still use it. And it's unbelievable. <laughs> I got a, a lot of grants from the Canadian government to go, but also my, my parents were really uh, kind and they sacrificed a lot for me to get there. And that was, uh, uh, I have a lot of guilt about that, actually. <laughs> but um, yeah, they helped me pay for the school and, and get me there. And then after school, I was basically on my own. But uh, they were really nice in helping me uh, pay for all that. So I didn't have to have the, the debt and that, that looming over me for the rest of my life. <laughs> Luckily, I was working at the same time I was going to school, meaning I had my design studio, my graphic design studio. I think I was the first student with cell phone in, in Art Institute because <laughs> I had to talk to like clients during the breaks and all that. So I was doing both working and going to school. So how I paid for it from, from you know, work, no, for my saving. It's, so no student loans or anything? No, I didn't get any support. I'm slightly envious, actually, because I'm still paying my student loans. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> but it did take a lot of the time that I could maybe spend in the studio because I had to work. You know, I had to do my design work to pay for it. So I was envy with the people who were like you, maybe. <laughs> Either had a loan or parents or got a scholarship from the school. I couldn't. I just had to juggle everything it was pretty intense time because of it but i enjoyed it do you feel like your education sort of for lack of a better word was like worth the money that you paid because it was pretty expensive it was a private very expensive Uh, that's a very tough question i'm sure everyone said the same sentence when you asked him no some people were very clear oh very absolutely (laughs) okay No, I mean, both positive and negative. It's it's not like it was like resoundingly one way, but like very, okay. usually people are pretty, pretty clear on that. Okay. So I'm not, because my experience is very mixed. I think that part of how I managed to get after, you know, to, to start my career was thanks to the fact that I was at a at school, at that specific school. At that specific time. At that specific too. time, exactly. Timing is everything. Maybe not. Maybe if I would have done it by myself, maybe. But it definitely helped that, let's say, Catherine Clark came to one of our student shows in the Diego, saw my work, and approached me. You know, she came to me. 
that's one example. Also, like I said, what I learned from my peers, you know, from Philippe and the other people, I kind of, in the school, I kind of pulled my two buddies and we were like doing work together, working or thinking together, not working together, but more like these were my buddies and um, that was Felipe and John. Of course, if it was like free education, like in some countries, I would be much happier. Look, I was living here already, so the cost was kind of built in. It's not like I had to move here and start paying extra rent. I had, you know, I had my business here. I had my life here. With, you know, it was expensive, but the fact that I, I don't remember it, it's probably I managed to kind of, <laughs> it didn't, it wasn't painful like for some people, right? So that probably was okay. I would say yes, but I have a lot of criticism of the Institute regardless of the cost, you know, but I think, yes, I definitely, especially because I jumped on my career right after school. It was pretty like right after it, I got shows and start showing. Um, I'm not trying to um, show off, but that's how it was. I think it has to do with the fact that I was a student there. I, I, I would have not done it any other way. I would not, by myself, I don't think I would manage to get there. So if that's the cost, yes. Now, can you do it better? <laughs> you and I know that you can't. They could have. To wrap this up, I'd like to thank you for listening all the way to the end of the conversation. We would appreciate it if you would share the podcast with your friends, family, coworkers, studio mates, or anybody with an interest in arts and creative endeavors. The building and strengthening of the arts and creative community is at the core of our mission for this podcast. They can listen and subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. We are produced by 5014. The audio was edited by Cush Audio Services, and the music was created by Pete Bybee. The Wise Fool Art Podcast is supported in part by an EEA grant from Iceland, Liechtenstein, and Norway in an effort to work together for a green, competitive, and inclusive Europe. We would also like to thank our partners Hunt Kastner in Prague, Czech Republic, and Kunst Centrene in Norge in Norway. Links to EEA grants and our partner organizations are available in the show notes or on our website, wisefoolpod.com.